Hello, I am Bernard Dern, Editor-in-Chief of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. I recently wrote an editorial on vagal nerve stimulation. Today, I am having a conversation with Bruno Bonaz from the University of Grenoble. Professor Bonaz has gained outstanding insights into the role of the vagal nerve from both his clinical practice and research. Thank you, Bruno, for sharing those insights. Would you please describe the vagal nerve? So the vagus nerve is the longest nerve of the organism, starting from the brain, in the brainstem, in the medulla, and then running uh, to the cervical level, and to the chest, and then to the abdomen. So it is the longest nerve, and it is composed of 80% of vagal afferents and 20% of vagal efferents. So vagal afferents inform the brain from the periphery, from what is going on on the periphery, while the vagal efferents modify the functioning of the digestive tract, for example, stimulating motility, acid secretion, and at the level of the heart, the vagus nerve decreases the heart rate. In recent years, there has been renewed interest in the anti-inflammatory effect of the vagal nerve. So in fact, the vagus nerve has a dual anti-inflammatory role. Do you mean through two different pathways? Yes, both through vagal afferents, which come from the periphery and uh, send projection to the medulla, and then activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, inducing the release of uh, glucocorticoid by the adrenal glands. Is there also an afferent anti-inflammatory pathway then? vagal efferents have also an anti-inflammatory effect through the release of acetylcholine which binds to alpha-7 nicotinic receptor of macrophages to inhibit the release of TNF-alpha. Do you know how important this is in physiology? It's very important because if you have a low vagal zone, you are supposed to have a pro-inflammatory state. Can we interfere with this? Of course, you can modulate that by pharmacology. If you target the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor with agonist, you can also stimulate the vagus nerve, for example, with physical exercise, relaxation, deep breathing, hypnosis, stimulate the vagus nerve. So I've also I supposed to have an anti-inflammatory role. And of course, you can stimulate the vagus nerve through vagus nerve stimulation uh, as performed in uh, epilepsy and depression. But in epilepsy and depression, you are supposed to activate vagal afferents, which go to the central nervous system to modulate the brain and to decrease the facility to to have uh, epilepsy, for example. And your work rather focuses on stimulating the efferent pathway? It was supposed to stimulate vagal efferents because uh, we wanted to stimulate the fibers who are involved in inflammation. But in fact, when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you stimulate both vagal afferents and efferents. So it's impossible, even at low frequency stimulation, which are supposed to activate vagal efferents, we have shown um, using brain imaging in rats that we also stimulate the brain. So in fact, when you stimulate the brain at low frequency, 5, 10 hertz, you stimulate also vagal afferents. For epilepsy and depression, the frequency of stimulation is 20 to 30 hertz, supposed to activate vagal afferents, but in fact, most likely that you stimulate both directions. So we should perhaps not be surprised when we see studies suggesting effects of vagal nerve stimulation on so many different conditions. Yes, exactly. Based both on the activation of vagal afferents to the brain and vagal efferents to the periphery. Which technological improvements would you like to see in this field? What should be nice is that, for example, to have a device who is able to record vagal tone the parameters of the vagus nerve, and then to stimulate the vagus nerve in case of a low vagal tone, for example, as it is already done for the heart pacemaker. So I think something like that should be interesting, you know. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much. You're welcome.